Words, and we are here to talk mules and donkeys for the next hour. Steve uh, Steve brought a scapula with him today, matter of fact, and we'll talk about that in a little bit here. Uh, Steve, how are you doing? Hey, I tell you what, <laughs> I, I, it, it, this, it's been pretty awesome. Um, it, to this day, we've had, uh, you know, we had a plumbing problem where we had a, a pipe break in the floor, so we've been having painters over construction guys and stuff yeah. like that you know but uh, it's been pretty incredible and then last night when we was over training at the fire department uh, the uh, battalion commander and one of the uh uh um why do i always do that you know uh anyway and one of the captains called me in and said hey steve uh we we need your help and uh would you uh, be uh, willing to, to help us out with the rehab and be the rehab specialist for the firefighters. How about that? And I said, awesome. Uh, I would love to do that. You know, so uh, I'm kind of, after I leave here, I, after I, yeah, once I get done here, I'm going down to the fire department and preparing some things because we got some, uh, this is fire season coming up here in Arizona. Yeah. It's 118 on the ground out there right now. And we're supposed to have all this week, uh, 100 plus even up to 110 115 yep. but the, the ground level that i've got right now it shows what's on the ground mm -hmm. is 118 degrees my goodness well congratulations that's pretty cool yeah i'm uh, wow i'm you know i'm i'm really excited about this uh, to be the rehab specialist that way i can with those we've been on a couple of pretty big size fires recently mm -hmm. and uh so now when they set and ask me to do this i'm I'm, I'm willing to help, whatever it takes to help, especially these first responders. Training mules and donkeys, training owners, and fighting fires. That's what we're talking about here today. Ask Steve. Yeah. So bring all of your firefighting questions as well as your mule and donkey questions. And if, hey, you've got a mule and donkey fighting fire question, feel free, bring those too. We have somebody uniquely <laughs> positioned to uh, answer those. Uh, if this is your first time ever hanging out with us, again, my name's Dave. This is Steve Edwards. Steve has been uh, cowboying all his life. He has been training mules and donkeys since the very early 80s, and he has been teaching people how to work and communicate and talk and think like a mule and a donkey uh, since the early 90s. And every Wednesday, we come together and uh, basically answer any questions that have come in through our website muleranch.com and then take any questions that folks ask here on the live stream uh, the way this goes if you've watched week after week which so many of you have and we're so glad that you're here uh, you know how it goes if you're new here's what we ask number one just put in the comment section uh, your name where you're watching from and what the weather is like today we love knowing that you are here with us hanging out spending some time and that this mule and donkey equine community is growing and thriving so we want to know that you're here put your name where you're watching from and uh, what the weather's like in the comment section number two ask any and every question you have we get a lot of repeat questions and we love that we love getting questions that are new we love getting questions that have been asked before because the repetition is where the learning happens you can hear something once Maybe it makes an okay sense. You can hear something twice. Oh man, I think I'm getting it. The third time you wind up hearing it. Okay, I feel confident able to go out there and apply these training techniques. So ask any and every question. We want to hear it. And the third thing, and y'all have been doing a wonderful job with this, is if you're watching on YouTube, copy the link and share it with friends or family who are in the equine community. And if you're on Facebook, go ahead and just type the at symbol and then type their name, tag them, so they can come hang out with us and watch. With that said, Steve, let's get into, uh, let's start with a question this week. A lot of time we start with greeting. Let's go ahead and we'll start with a, uh, start with a question. And um, this one comes from Caleb. Uh, he emailed in, he said, hey Steve, I'm having issues with my mule. Well, Caleb, that's what we're here for. I have been riding him for about three years with the same saddle with little to no issues. Or so I thought. How many times have we yeah. heard that? I just started watching your videos and the saddle I thought was a mule saddle appears to be a horse saddle. About two weeks ago, I started to leave white marks about two thirds the way down the bars towards the back of the saddle and about five down from the spine. At this point, I went and spent $300 on a five-star mule trail pad. 
I rode for about Ooh. five hours and pulled the saddle. Basically, the whole area where the tree sits was bone dry. We've heard that. We have never seen a dry spot this big and uniform. I have started watching your videos and they make sense. I have a trip to the mountains in July and need to get this situation fixed. Would it be possible to talk with you on the phone, Caleb? Yes, we'd love to get you on the phone with Steve, but before we do that, Steve, why don't you talk to us a little bit here? We've got a few things going on. Number one, we've got a mule that we thought didn't have any problems three years in. Number two, we have a saddle that we thought was a mule saddle. Of course, a lot of them say mule saddle, mule bars. Uh, and number three, yep. we've got uh, white hairs that are being caused, I'm guessing by scalding because it's bone dry underneath that pad. Um, we want to get this worked out. What would you say for Caleb? Well, yeah, I, and I've actually have talked to Caleb and uh, he's, he's getting ready to go in the mountains in Colorado and he's a pretty good sized guy and stuff. but. Yeah, you know, Dave, I'm not, I'm not passing out any names of saddles and stuff like this. Sure, but, sure. You know, everybody wants to get out there and, and, uh, and uh, sell stuff, and I understand that. Uh, and, and, but here's the thing, Dave. Most people just have not spent enough time with Mr. Mule. Mm -hmm. They think their saddle's doing okay. It's working yep. out. They see it's working and things like that. But... When it comes to the longevity of it, sooner or later it's going to show up. Yep. White hairs, they don't scare me. White hairs basically say, I've overheated my mule one day. I didn't take a break with the mule. <clears throat> and here's the thing, folks. When you take a break, which you should do quite often, every two and a half, three hours, get off, stretch around and things like this. But you should also give your mule a break. Pull the bridle off. Hang it on the horn. Let his mouth get quiet. Take the and, and loosen up the cinches. Lift up the back of the saddle. Shake it up and down a few times. Let some cool air go through there. <clears throat> now I don't know about you, Dave, but when it's hot, I don't want to wear wool. You know, it's uh, yeah. Not so, my preference. Not my first choice. No, no. And why in the world would we want to put wool? on an animal's back. I mean, you know, it's tradition, I realize. I realize it's tradition. I used to have a wool Navajo blanket under my saddles for years because it was tradition. That's what yeah. we did. But when it comes down to it, the white marks that Caleb's talking about are white marks uh, that are scald. Now, the next part, the dryness. Why the dryness? Mm -hmm. Because those hair follicles have died back. And now they don't sweat like they do. That's the thing about the hair is it's supposed to sweat and help cool the animal off. You want sweat. You want it to sweat the more the better, especially underneath the blanket and at the cinch. Those two places, you want as much sweat as possible. You want it to be too cool, but most of all, get this thing, folks, to lubricate. That's lubrication. So uh, those areas he's talking about is right underneath his seat. Mm -hmm. And their fat pockets there. Mm -hmm. Fat pockets run across the, the crest of the neck. They run across the the top of the of the ribs, <clears throat> across there, and then the dock of the tail. Now, what happens is, especially if you get a mule that really has prevalent uh, fat pockets in that area, those really get rubbed heavy, especially if you're using wool pads because wool. Just listen to their commercials. They say it whisk away the moisture. Well, why do you want to take away the natural lubrication, natural yeah. way to keep cool? So right. one of the reasons it's happening, he says it didn't happen in his horses. Well, no, you've got a mule. You have fat pockets on the mule or you don't have fat pockets on the horse. Folks, that's the difference we're here. We got mm -hmm. the mule uh, uh, bone structure, but we also have the fat pockets. Dave, I was just talking with a guy today yeah. One of the contractors that was here, and he says he's riding his mule along, and all of a sudden the mule he's riding the wash, the mule just laid right down, and one of the guys hollered out, "He's dead! He's dead! He's about a 24 year old mule." So they pulled the saddle off of him. He got to groaning, and they rubbed him and stuff, and waited, and the mule stood right up. Well, he got to looking at it, and all the all the dry spots were right around where the cinch was, and I said, "You over tightened your front cinch." 
And he says, yeah, you know, he's, he's, this guy's about 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. So we have to have the, si the saddle really tight for him to get on. <clears throat> so once again, folks, we don't, we don't know no better, right? I mean, it's, it's not your fault until you learn, until you hear me say, why are you over tightening the front cinch? Don't do that. The back cinch is the most important. Front cinch is the least important, all right? Now, the next thing is where those D-rings are are really, really important. That rear D-ring helps balance the saddle and take pressure off the area that works. So the scalding, you know, that's not completely the saddle. It's not completely the pad. What it is, is we need to take time once in a while to lift up the back of the saddle and let layer through there. Now, the ones that's hard to do that with are the pack mules, the pack saddles. You know, they're packing freight and it's difficult to be able to loosen it up and let cool air go through there. It's really difficult, I understand. So you see that quite often and the pack mule pays the price. But folks, with our saddle animals, Take a little time, rest them, lift up the back of the saddle, let cool air go through there, let them stand there nice and quiet, <coughs> and then cool down, and then re cinch them up, you know, and then go at it. So, um, make a long story short, Caleb, it looks like he's going to be, uh, he, he's tried different saddles and has finally come down to it that he's, it's just not working. He had some friends that had one of my saddles, he saw how it worked nice friend told him about things and, and away you go, Dave. Right, very good. Uh, so the, one of the things that we like to emphasize is we actually don't sell mule saddles at muleranch.com. Matter of fact, uh, we didn't plan on selling saddles at all. It was one of these deals where uh, as Steve began spending time all the way from Casper, his first mule, to Stacy, his wife's mule that passed away several years ago, uh, Steve said, I'm going to sit and watch and learn from the mule. And so as he you know, started to learn about the mule, he went and said, well, hey, all of these saddles, these quarter horse saddles, um, they're hitting these points right here and they're scooting forward. You know, can you give me something like this? No one had anything. Well, by golly, I'm going to do right by my mule. So Steve made his own saddle. And then when he found out that other people we're having the same problems. Well, that's when we got into the saddle business. We never got into the saddle business to get into the saddle business. We got into the saddle business because folks needed a saddle that had different bars. So we don't sell mule bars. You can find saddles all over the internet that say mule bars. We sell Steve's yeah. bars and there is a difference. And if you want to know more about that, give Steve a call. He'll talk to you. Matter of fact, I've got a, a, a mule saddle training course. It's absolutely free. We put it in uh, the comment section and the reason why we make it available for free is because we care about you and we care about your mule and we just want to give you the information and you can decide for yourself. So let's take a look here. See all who is joining us uh, over on YouTube. We've got a good group of people here today. We've got Shelly from Sook, uh, British Columbia, Canada. So right off the bat, we've gone international. We've got Don. Uh, hello, my Christian brothers. It has been a while. Don, we are so grateful that you are here. Myra, who we've been uh, messaging back and forth with. Hi, Myra. It's good to have you here. So glad. This is me. I'm Dave. This is my face. Uh, been seeing you in the email. Uh, greetings from uh, Ojai, California. Glad to be here with you. Dawn says she's watching from Connecticut. Weather a little cloudy. Uh, now it was beautiful in the 70s. Shelly says it's sunny, 75 degrees here in British Columbia. Steve, Shelly has a question. We'll answer. We'll ask this yeah. question, then we'll get to Facebook and start welcoming folks. She says, what is your opinion on treeless saddles, barefoot Cheyenne used for my horse, using these on a mule? Treeless saddles, Steve. Yeah, well, folks, uh, and, I, and I almost grabbed my bars and brought them too, but the purpose of the bar, folks, that it lays across the back of the mule is to support your weight evenly across the back. The problem is with the treeless saddle, you're only putting pressure in two places, where you set and on the pummel. The pummel is the worst place because that comes down, that D-ring comes down and attaches to your cinch. That pummel is setting in that, in that sixth and seventh rib area where that fat pocket is. And that gets a lot of stress. Your treeless saddles 
are just not the best thing in the world uh, for your horses and definitely no good for the mule because of their bone structure and their fat pockets. It puts the pressure in the wrong places. Just get a saddle that has bars that evenly distributes the weight across the animal's back and that way you'll have a comfortable animal. Uh, and, and, and believe me, I've seen the stress from the uh, treeless saddles that that people just wouldn't believe that happens again down the road. You know. Yeah, um, you see that stress, and then we hear reports all the time of people going from stress with whatever saddle is they're using to changing the way they tack, and oftentimes changing the saddle that they're using. And they say it's like night and day. They say it's different. Matter of fact, I probably have fifty comments uh, that I've taken screenshots of from Facebook, emails, text messages that you get uh, just in the last. I don't know, six months of people saying the same thing. So great question, Shelly. Really appreciate you asking. Uh, Red Eagle is here over on uh, YouTube. We've got David Walls. We've got uh, Robert. We've got Jason and Susan, all of our friends over on YouTube. And uh, we'll get to your questions on YouTube over on Facebook. Ginger is here. Ginger, it's good to have you. Sharon and Steve are watching. Hello. Uh, Casey, back again this week. Steve, rain, rain, and more stinking rain here in Mount Vernon, Missouri. Another Mount Vernon for you. That's right. Last week we had like three or four Mount Vernons that we were talking yep. about. So good to have you here, Casey. Uh, James uh, is watching from Holden, Missouri. We've got Joy. Hi, Steve and Dave. Cool morning here in Maryboro, Queensland, Australia. Steve, we've gone international again. Uh, David Pingelli's watching. Sierra is here. Uh, Dorsey is here. Let's get to a question here. Uh, let's see. Ginger says, hey, I've been waiting to get some advice today. Ginger, you've come to the right place and your patience will be rewarded. I'll keep it as short as possible. Lucas is four-year-old mammoth and I got dirt cheap because he was a he had a terrible habit of running over people. Man, that is a bad habit. I watched all Steve's videos about it and when I pick him up, uh, I hang his halter placement and handle techniques and have it almost fixed. Should I lunge him or just walk him back to the mounting block again and again? So a question first is what is lunging? And then number two, is that the solution for what she's talking about here? Well, lunging is basically you take your equine on the end of a long rope and you take a whip on the other end and you have them go around in circles around you to warm them up. And a lot of horses especially uh, have to be warmed up uh, to be able to then climb on and ride. I personally uh, don't do that at all. Uh, if you know, if you if that makes you feel good, do it. You know, I personally just saddle the animal up in stages and and take my time. The problem is a lot of people will cinch it all up at one time, mm -hmm. and then they have to move the animal around a lot in order to get the saddle to kind of set into place. But I prefer to cinch, move, cinch, move, cinch, climb on and go. You know. So, uh, so she, she, I'll interrupt you here real quick, Steve. Running over top of you, that has a lot to do with with the poor communication on the end of the lead rope and also uh, halters. Folks, you can't use a nylon halter or a leather halter. It puts pressure in the wrong places and the mule has no respect for it. The donkey has no respect for it and they can, they'll pretty much take you anywhere you want and you'll be mule skiing, you know. Yeah, uh, which is not a good deal, you know. Uh, so she one said, my, one of my good friends now, but yeah. Ted Brooks, up in uh, up in Maine area, I trained on him and some of his mules uh, over the years, and he run through a lot of problems like this, to where people had ill trained the mules, and he just run into problem after problem, and finally end up getting rid of them, and and got a couple other really nice mules uh, from. Uh, a, a very good friend of mine and uh, that we're well trained and, and there are some good mules out there folks the thing is is most horsemen are using horse techniques uh, like with bits and saddles and things like this using horse techniques which is not working on mr. mule because of the donkey side you know 
Yeah. Well, she she added, and I missed this, she sent it in over a, a few threads here. And so the, the another thing she added was, um, today he ran me over at the mounting block. I went at him like a spider monkey and then right back to the block uh, until he stood quiet. Uh, how would you fix this? So is that kind of in line with what you're saying? Like this is a ground communication issue? Yeah, I would put the come along hitch on. I would do ground communication, get the mule uh, or the donkey. And she said uh, mammoth, so it could be a donkey. So it just does, has to not learn how to stand still. Folks, when you're working with a mule or a donkey, the first thing you want to do is get them to learn to stand still. Flight and fright is natural. They naturally want to move their feet and go from what they perceive as a problem. Now, you're on a mounting block. You're, you're in a very vulnerable position. You're getting ready to climb on and the donkey, the mule moves off. Well, it could be the yes, they're trained. They're, they're not trained to stand still. And as you know, Dave, I've taken and taught people how to shake a saddle horn to right. get them to stand still. Yep. Now, it could be just like the guy I was talking to today that he said the mule kept moving, the mule kept moving out of the way. And, uh, and finally, he figured out that it was actually a saddle problem, you know, that every time he would climb on, it would pressure the mule and the mule would be uncomfortable. And today, the mule just laid down, you know. So, you know, it could be such a variety of things. Always start with, always start with ground communication. Always get them to learn to stand still and move when you want them. The next thing you want to do is, the next question I would say to you is, why is the mule moving? So if we do the ground communication and you taught the mule to stand still, but he's still moving, okay, do we not have our saddle adjusted right? Or do we not have our bridle adjust right? So it should can be, it could be a multitude of things here uh, that we're not, you know, that we don't see the whole picture, but always start groundwork and work your way from there. Very good. Um, so uh, one thing to mention here is that if you do have questions about the way you've saddled up and tacked up your animal, uh, you can send those to Steve. He'll take a look right yeah. there on a text message and get back to you ASAP. And sometimes you it, you can have all of the right equipment. You can have you can buy everything that Steve sells, and if it's not saddled up the right way you're not going to get the results that you're looking for. Um, so it's very, very helpful to just, you know, send it over to Steve, say, hey, Steve, take a look. What do you think? Get some feedback. Often, you know, you're doing a bunch of things right. You just make one little subtle change and uh, and that's all you need and you're right back on your way. So good question there. Appreciate that, Ginger. Um, let's see. Uh, back to Facebook. Uh, Sierra says, hi, 18-year-old mule. Teeth good, worm free. What's the best feed to get some weight on him? I'm not riding him until he fattens up. Steve, I know that you have an opinion on what you like to see on uh, on your animals. Uh, what would you have to say here for Sierra? I, I don't like fat mules, folks. That's a that's a, a lot of weight upon donkey feet and legs. I like to see a little bit of rib. That's good. I don't like to see the top line gone, okay? But a little bit of rib is okay. Um, uh, you need to ride and exercise, not just do the diet thing. Uh, we've got uh, some articles on that and some feed that we suggest and, uh, and also a feeding program that I suggest. And Dave, I'm sure you can send some information there. But uh, folks, fat mules are not happy mules. They're not. Uh, it's really hard to keep a saddle on a fat mule. It's really difficult to have uh, a, a fat mule be able to make it through the day uh, because they just don't have the muscle power. So riding plus a good feeding program is, what's, is what this, uh, this mule needs. And one of the things that you'll talk about a little bit, if I remember correctly, it's, uh, it's feed, feed to use. Can you talk about that real quick? You, you bet, and that's really important. Uh, I just had one of my clients over the weekend show me a bucket of grain that he was giving his meal, which was good. Okay, so what he was doing, he had the grain going, and, and, I, and I suggest rolled oats, not whole oats, not crimped oats, but rolled oats. That way it builds energy. It also works on helping the muscle mass. And uh, he, was, he was feeding the, the meal roll, I mean, uh, uh, whole oats, while he was saddling. Now, what's gonna happen is, 
as he's going down the trail, the roll oats are going to give his mules energy to be able to get up the trail. So when you when you're when you're working them hard and going up the trail and redoing a lot of trail riding, you don't want to keep the same mule feeding program. You want to feed them if they're standing still. That's going to be one feeding program. If you're going to be doing a lot of trail riding, give them oats at that time only to go down the trail. But don't feed them oats all the time. You're not trying to fatten them. You're just trying to give them energy. So feed them according to what you're going to be doing. I put two resources in the comments section that Steve has put together for y'all. Uh, feed is something that we get a lot of questions about, so we went ahead and put these resources together. Number one is a video of Steve with, uh, with Steve talking with uh, a representative from Lake and Milling, and they're talking about creating a nutrition program for your mule and for your donkey. Um, a great free video. Just follow the link, put in your email address. We'll send you access to that video. Uh, the second thing that we've got in there is Mules Cannot Stand Prosperity. It's an article that Steve wrote, which uh, kind of outlines what you're doing when you allow all these ca carbohydrates into uh, the mule system, you're, you're in effect uh, fueling up a rocket ship and it's going to launch and take off. Um, and, and that's where a lot of problems come from. And in that article, he specifies what types of vitamins and minerals and things of this sort that you want to look for in a feed. So go check those out. Those are in the comment section. Those are free and they're there for you to, to use and access for you and the benefit of your mule. We've got Red Eagle tapping red saying thanks for the great come along video and the come along and halter. Everything you say works great. Just got Abner my mule Monday and we are leaps and bounds ahead of the curve that is fun wow. to hear how awesome Good. david is watching from uh kentucky he said he missed out on this week last week well dave we're glad that you're here this week yeah. and folks if you miss any weeks they're all on youtube so you just go to the youtube channel queen valley mule ranch you can find all of our replays which reminds me I need to welcome folks who are just now tuning in. We got folks coming in and out the entire hour. So my name's Dave. This is Steve Edwards. Steve's been working with mules and donkeys since the early 80s, been training and teaching people how to work with mules and donkey since the early 90s. But you know you can trust it all because he's been cowboying his entire life. What we do is we come answer mule and donkey questions for an hour every Wednesday. So put your name, where you're watching from, what the weather's like in the comment section. We want to say hi to you. Number two, ask your questions. Question. And number three, share the link with friends and family if you're watching on YouTube or tag friends and family in the uh, comment section if you're watching on Facebook. Just type the at symbol and then type their name, tag them. They will thank you. You'll become their favorite person. Uh, Red Eagle says, Abner is spray bottle shy. I need to spray him with some fly repellent. I've used the come along to stand him still even after showing the bottle and waving it. Uh, he is okay, but once I spray, he freaks out. Out, any help would be greatly appreciated. Steve, is this is this when we want to start desensitizing? Well, well here's the thing <laughs> with the, the spray. It's amazing. Yeah, they see the bottle and stuff, but all of a sudden they feel the little spray and they hear the noise. You know, uh, one lady thought it was sounded like a rattlesnake. No, nothing like it. But here's the thing, Dave, when it comes down to riding a mule, it's our timing doing it before it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. It's like going down the road, I'm driving my car, and all of a sudden I hear the rumble strip. Well, what happened? I didn't pay attention as the road went, and so I end up veering to the right, and the rumble strip helped me stay in place. So let's go back. When, when it comes down to getting the mule to stand still, and now we start using something that stresses the mule out, well, it's gonna be our timing. So. I take and I give it a couple squirts, and here's what happens. If the feet already moved, it's too late. So what, ha what do we have to look for first? Always look for what causes the problem. Okay, so what causes the problem is the mist. So then what's next? The mule will elevate his head and throw his head up and his nose up. Then the feet move. So let's fix it while the nose is moving before the feet move. So. We have the come along rope and do not hold the come along rope short. Have about three to four feet so that you got leverage. That way you got leverage 
to be able to do the bumping with. So you have the come along rope on, you've got three to four ro feet of rope, you're standing at the shoulder with the nose tipped towards you. Do not stand directly in front of the mule, okay? Step, step to the left, why is that? I wanna teach the left eye first, this is the squirt, okay? Once I get the mule to learn to stand still with the left eye, then I go over to the right side and I do the squirting. Do not teach both brains at the same time. So this is gonna help you with your timing. This is not a matter of, of uh, anything else but my timing. So this is gonna improve your timing. When you squirt, you see the nose move, bump the nose. If the feet already moved, it's too late. So try to get your timing. Now, I'm in the saddle and all of a sudden my mule jumps. This is gonna help your timing to go right, left, right, left to say, don't jump. You got the idea? So it's going to improve by using that lead rope, it's going to improve the way you communicate all through the rest of your time frame with your mule or your donkey, okay? So the spray, the nose, fix the nose. Because after the nose moves, the neck moves, the shoulder moves, we're gone. Very good. Uh, got lots of really great conversation over here going on Facebook. Um, Casey says, can I share the best advice I've learned from my mule Kevin lately? Now, I'll tell you what, I haven't read the rest of the comment here, but I love that because that's how you've learned everything you've learned, Steve, right? Listening yep. to the mule and the donkey. Can I share the best advice I've learned from my mule Kevin lately? If he could speak, he would say, when I do one thing wrong, don't forget all the things I've done right. Patience is something yeah, I am working on. Kevin and Steve have nothing, have nothing, uh, Kevin and Steve have nothing taught me a lot, if nothing, have taught me a lot of patience. Good. Good for That's her. awesome. You bet. Love you bet. That. You know, that, that one thing is really good. Yeah, we can have a multitude of other things, but why hold that against them? Don't yeah. do that. Just, just forgive it. Go on and stay stay with the program you know yep. good for kevin there you go you know, and, good, uh, and good for kevin's, kevin's owner yeah there you go casey she's got it uh dorsey crow here will your mule riders martingale help me with my mule bucking Ooh. yes no all right let's start with the no the no the the, the mule bucking doesn't always isn't always one particular problem. Now, let's go back. With the mouth, and the mule will drop his head, the lower shelf goes forward, and the TMJs hang up. That will scare the mule, and that will make him want to buck. Not only will it scare the mule, but it'll hurt the mule and the donkey and make him want to buck or run off, okay? So, how do we fix that? We take him to the vet and we get the teeth floated, we get him balanced, get him shaped up, and then every year after that, we balance, the, we float the teeth every year. Don't miss a year. Every spring, it gets done. Now, let's go back. The mule has to be in some serious pain for him to want to buck. So, if you wanna send me some pictures of, hey, this is my mule, all rigged up, saddle, everything put together, let me tell you. Uh, let me kind of help you because it could be maybe you got the saddle in the wrong place. So all we have to do is get you to move your saddle around, adjust your rear bridge or, or, or adjust the rear cinch, some things like this, and I can get you lined up pretty good. We'll get you all fixed up. Over on YouTube, uh, Robert's watching from Dietrich, Idaho. Good to have you here, Robert. Jason from Washington State, sunny and 80 degrees. We'll take it. Susan's watching. She says, hi, guys. I rarely listen to you live, but catch it on the replay almost every week, which, like I said, if you miss us live or you want to go back and listen to any of the 60-plus shows that we've done, you can find us on YouTube. Just do search for Queen Valley Mule Ranch. 
She says, I learn something every time. Thanks for what you do for our wonderful mules. Susan, it's our pleasure. I know I speak for Steve saying we really do enjoy connecting and uh, getting the information out there. Dale is watching. Hi, guys. Just got in from work. This is Dale Williamson in Keller, Texas. T-minus two days to picking up my new mule. Thanks for all the help. Dale, how awesome. Glad to see There's it coming together. Story. There's a story yeah. right there. Yeah, let me tell you something. Dale calls me up. Dale's got bucked off of his mule. Mule went to bucking. Well, he calls me up. He said, man, Steve, my mule went to bucking. I said, all right, two things I want you to do. Go get the teeth done and get a chiropractor onto that mule and check out his back. Send me a picture of your saddle setting on the mule. Well, sure enough, saddle wasn't setting right. And so he shifted it back. He readjusted the breaching. The mule bucked him off again. So he says, well, thanks, Steve, what do I do? And I says, well, what kind of saddle you got? Well, I've got, you know, this here horse saddle I got from so-and-so. I says, well, you're gonna have problems. You got pressure on six and seven rib. Long story short, he even put my saddle on him mm. and the mule bucked him off. Mm. I said, all right, tell me what the chiropractor said. He said, Steve, I never made it to the chiropractor. I said, all right. Take him to the chiropractor, get that done first. My saddle is not the magic fix-all for your bucking mule. So, now he is a retired uh, commercial aircraft pilot. And he also teaches uh, police officers how to fly helicopters mm -hmm. and other people. Mm -hmm. So this guy's multi-talented when it comes to flying high. Uh, he flies high on the right animals, the right things, rather than flying high and bucking getting hit the ground. Yeah. So he finally has a uh, student that is a veterinarian, that, and he started telling the veterinarian about the problem. Yeah. The veterinarian says, well, let me, uh, let me go look at your mule for you. So he did, and he shot a couple pieces of, of, uh, of x-rays and stuff, and guess what he found, Dave? <laughs> right here. Oh, man. Folks, you see this? This is the scapula. Yeah, we were talking about this last this week. Right here. Yeah. This is the fiber that sets on top of the scapula. Here's your scapula. And this one happens to be off an antelope. But here's this fiber that sets above. And when, when you first do your dissecting, when you're cutting the meat off the scapula, this is real soft. Real soft. Now it's hard. Notice how it's cracking. That mule scapula had started cracking, and every time he put the saddle on the mule, it would bump on this, and yeah. he was done. Yeah, of course. Dave, I'm going to talk to this veterinarian and have him write me up some stuff and send it to us <clears throat> so that we can help people to say, this is true. This yeah. is what happened. So he ended up taking this mule down to New Orleans, and the mule does great for wagons. Pulling wagons. No problem at all. Cannot have anything on his back. And this is good because if this scapula is broken down, usually they're too crippled. But mm -hmm. they happen to catch it just right. Yeah. Just right. And, <coughs> and so Easy. they fix the problem. All right, now, now, what he's saying is he's happy he's going to go in two days. Jimmy Williams, my good brother in the Lord, Jimmy Williams, who is – not a mule trainer, and he'll tell you, I'm not a mule trainer. He has a mega corporation that they do road work and construction and all kinds of tractors and stuff like that. Okay. That's how he makes a living. Jimmy loves training mules, and once in a while he will have a good one for sale, and he sells the mule, and that's what happened. Dell Williamson got himself a really, he sent me the videos, well-trained cool. mule. Very cool. Hey. That's what we're looking for right there. That's great. Probably great disposition. Probably great confirmation. Yeah. Yeah. And and Jimmy's been a longtime friend now. And brother in the Lord, he has 10 of my saddles. Wow. Yeah, 10 of them. He's got probably the most saddles of, of any of, of my clients. A couple of them got close to him. But he's uh, he's got a lot of friends that rides with him. Plus, he has a lot of mules. He loves his mules. I mean, that's his way to escape life. Is through yeah. his mules, you know. But now Dale Williamson has a nice mule. But there's a story for you. I can't wait to talk to that veterinarian 
and get that information so people yeah. can see it. It's not yeah. just what Steve says. You know, I had learned and I crippled a lot of animals, a lot of them, and I feel I feel so horrible for what I've done to the mule, thinking that ah, is just an animal. No, this mule, it's up to me to take care of this mule. And if I take care of him, he'll take care of me. And so right here, this scapula, folks, you put that saddle up on this mule's back, and every time this scapula comes up, it bangs on that saddle, you're up a creek. Bang, bang, bang. It just hurts me, Dave, to see uh, one of my clients bought some mules off of the sale. Mm -hmm. And here's these nice mules they spent a mega money on. I don't know how much, but it was one of the mega sales. And every one of those saddles were sitting on top of the scapula. And once my client started seeing, he said, wow, I never knew that, Steve. I never knew it was causing a problem, you know? And I said, well, let me send you a picture of a scapula and you see what happens, you know, folks. It's, it's a, if you're looking at buying mules, don't buy mules of people who are setting their saddles way ahead or they don't have a rear cinch, or they don't have a breaching. Those folks are nice folks. I mean, they're really trying hard to, you know, to keep up the mule community, but they're doing a lot of destroying, and and they don't really know. So tell them. <laughs> that's why. That's why we tell folks to share the broadcast, tag their friends and family, because we just yeah. we believe in respecting the uniqueness of the mule and the donkey made different than the horse. It's not all equine is equine. If there's one thing I've learned is that, uh, you know, God really made these animals different and unique. Yeah. And, you know, th th there's a reason why they take the, the mules and the donkeys down into the Grand Canyon, right? There's a yeah. reason why, why I think the only place in the, in the United States where they still deliver mail uh, by Burrow is Grand Canyon down into down into the, the the center of the Grand Canyon, and there's there's a reason why. Uh, that and there's one other place. Where's that? Well, it, it's over in California. Okay. They actually are using donkeys and not mules. Oh. And these donkeys all got my pack saddles, and they over in the hills of the Sierras. And there's this one place down this canyon, and the only way people get stuffed up and down yeah. is by these donkeys. There you go. So they actually hire these donkeys and they pack the stuff down. They pack their groceries and stuff down and they walk down in this canyon to their little cabins. Some of these cabins have been built 100 years ago. But they're that's different. the only other place. Yeah, they're different. They're unique. And uh, and that requires a different and unique approach to loving and caring on them. Uh, Shelly chimed back in. She said, thanks for the treeless saddle answer. I'll start saving up and call you about your mule saddles. Uh, if you have any questions, folks, you can call Steve. Uh, met the phone number is on the website, muleranch.com. Richard is watching yeah. from Palestine, Texas. What a day, he says. Laurel is watching. Greetings from Greenview, California. Red Eagle says, great. Thank Thank you for answering that question. I appreciate it, and I'll definitely put it to good use. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Michael's watching. Misty is watching. Hi, fellows. Just in from Come Alonging, Come Alonging Mule in rain, 70 degrees in Signal, Montana. Misty, it's good to have you here. Glad you're spending yeah. a few minutes with us. Uh, back over on Facebook, we got a few more folks who have chimed in and started watching. Um, let's see here. We've got uh, uh, David from Sonoya, Georgia. David Pengelly watching. Come along, coffee. Uh, let's see. We've got Cowboy Ken. Uh, hello, guys. Cowboy Ken from Connecticut. Good to have you here, Cowboy Ken. And I kept saying Cowboy Ken. I, I just read it today. Cowboy Ken. Cowboy Ken. Not Cowboy Ken. Cowboy Ken. <laughs> there we go. I, I finally got it. I, I Slower. Yeah. But I got it. Uh, David Scholl's watching here. Good morning from the Worm Farm. We we're hard at it. All right, we've gone international again. We've got Lauren watching. How do you deal with trying to find a child saddle for a small mule, a small mini mule, or a pony? Child saddle. Mm. Well, that's quite difficult. Uh, I just sent out uh, my 15-inch uh, trail light to a lady riding a, a donkey. Now she can ride the 15 inch saddle, but I put a set of bucking rolls on the saddle and now it makes it small enough that her daughter of six years old uh, can set in the saddle, you know. 
Now, uh, the wonderful thing about this lady in, in Utah, she has camels and canines as well, and now she's got donkeys. But the, the, the unique thing about her is uh, she really loves her, her camels, but then she got into the donkeys and her daughter just loves it. So uh, she wants to be able to ride as well and have her donkeys, uh, for, have her donkey for her daughter. So those bucking rolls, this is the pummel right here, and then you set a pair of, a pair of ducking, a bucking rolls on it, and it ends up taking a 15 inch saddle and makes it a 13 inch saddle. So it takes a couple inches away and makes for a nice saddle that you can not only ride yourself, but your child can ride on it. And these bucking rolls go on with two screws and, and a little tightening in the middle and you're done. Uh, it's really difficult. I know it's kind of pricey too, to buy a child saddle and just have it just for one purpose because you all know them kids grow up and in a short time and you just bought them a pair of shoes and a few months later, <laughs> they're not big enough for the right size. So here's the same thing with this saddle. Uh, why not buy an adult saddle, put a set of bucking rows on it and you're off and running. Yep, a lot of times folks will ask us, hey, do you have any used saddles for sale? And the answer is no, two reasons. Number one, they hold their value really, really well. And so there's not much difference between a used saddle and a new saddle. Uh, and number two, Folks just don't get rid of them. Occasionally, you'll find one on an eBay or a Facebook marketplace or something, and often it's because uh, the mule passed or the owner sold the mule, and that was about it. Um, but uh, but when you come talking about getting a saddle, you can use those bucking rolls, and you can make that saddle last for a long time. Not get to the point where you you know you're like, hey, you know, child outgrew it, and now we got nothing to do with it. No, you can get it. Install those bucking rolls. It's real easy to do. I just put a link in the comment section so you all can see Steve actually installing bucking rolls. Um, and if you have any concerns or about installing, just call Steve ahead of time. He'll be willing to he'll be willing to talk you about it and, and walk you through it if needed. Um, let's see here. So hopefully that helps you, Lauren. Uh, let's see. Yolanda's here. Hey, Yolanda. We have gone Yolanda. international again. Yolanda is holding down the uh, the Netherlands, the equine community, the mule and donkey community in the Netherlands. Ain't that right, Steve? Yep, she is. And, and Yolanda has a special secret that she's going to share in about two weeks or so. Ooh. So she, she doesn't want to share it out now. Doesn't want uh, to. But it's really, really unique. You know, uh, Yolanda had sent me some pictures and said, Steve, the breaching is rubbing on the mule. Now, Yolanda has a dapple gray mule. Now, the, there's, a, there's a magazine, a book actually out, that's called The Mule, and, uh, and it, was, it was written back in the 1860s, and it talks about a man who was the head of the mule department during the Civil War. And he talks about mules, about different colors and how they are. Now, one thing he said, and it's held good for me all these years, was when you have a multicolored mule, they really, really, uh, they, they bruise easy and the hide comes off them really easy. They're, they seem to be very tender hided. So what he did, he would keep a can of urine around and he would splash urine on the places to toughen them up. Now that's kind of nasty, Dave. So uh, I like to use a mouthwash like Listerine. And when you do get a rub, splash a little mist Listerine on there. Now, here's the thing. When you have a paint mule or a dapple gray or, or uh, a lighter colored mule, all those mules, they're really easy to put white spots on. Uh, your black mules, and, and this sort of thing are not quite as tough, but they usually won't show up. Even even a britchen mark or a cinch mark on these lighter colored mules, your dapple grays, your paints, uh, they will show up really quick because they seem to be thin skinned. So be prepared for that, folks. There's no such thing as not scratching your mule. Fluffy can lose hair but it will come back, it's not a big deal. Sometimes it's just a little bit of adjustment. So usually what happens is on a breaching, rather than setting flush against the hip, it's away from the hip. And you can see when it moves, there's a gap on the bottom and it's tight on the top. 
so it ends up taking a hair. So it can be just a simple matter of some minor adjustments and you can get it. But especially on your lighter color mules, they seem to be thinner skin. So be prepared to have some places that's going to rub. Very good. Uh, let's see here. Um, Jason sent me an email and he says, I hate to keep bugging you guys and it's no bugging at all. He says, I've been building the foundation with the come along hitch and moved to the martingale. First time uh, it's used in the round pin, she started bucking. Is this normal? Yeah, especially if you haven't had the teeth balanced and framed up. Uh, uh, that is, a lot of times they'll go to bucking because the breaching is pestering them. And it's not really so much bucking as it is kicking out. So it could be the breaching. They're, they're concerned about that as well. Uh, you you want to send me a picture. Let me have a look, see how you got your mule rigged up. Uh, and I'll be happy to look at it. Uh, so, but but if, usually if they'll go to bucking in a bridle, that means their TMJs are hanging up. And you probably need to get your teeth floated. Very good. Thank you for that, Steve. Jason, give Steve a uh, – shoot him a text message and uh, send a picture and we'll get you going. Uh, question here from Myra. Uh, been messaging back and forth with her. Hope she, hopefully she's still watching. She says, do you know if the trail, if the Mule Riders Martingale design can be used with my bridle? Not sure if that's a good question for the podcast. If, uh, if you are wanting to sell the whole setup. There she goes. So using the Mule Riders Martingale with a bridle. Okay. The thing is, is I've designed – the Mule Riders Martingale, which I've got one right here, okay? And the bit and this sort of thing. I've designed it on the beta using the beta. I'm, I'm looking for balance, I'm looking for freedom, things like this in the bit. Just the Martingale itself, the strap with the strings on somebody else's bit or bridle may not balance the bridle, the bit in the mouth correctly. And so, a lot of folks will just put, well, I'll just put a double twisted wire snap for bit in and I'll have equal to Steve's Martingale. No, that's not it because just the bit by itself will make the mule gap his mouth, throw his head up and take off running. That's why I developed the Martingale using the string on the bit. Now you see this, mm -hmm. how the string goes into the rein itself. So this is like a violin on, a, on, on a, a bow going back and forth right here in this area, back and forth. So as they feel the string on the bit, that light touch keeps them light and keeps them from throwing their head up. One of the reasons I use a double twisted wire snap with bit is because it's easier on the mammal's mouth. The double twisted wire itself actually communicates to the whole tongue, not just one spot. So we, we've got some video that we can help you with with that. So mm -hmm. my bits, my double twisted wire snap with bits, they're six inches long. Why is that? Because if you go into a smaller mouth and use a smaller mouth, the bit will actually go smaller. So you can go smaller, narrower, or wider. Now, it's not important when you're building a foundation to create one wrinkle or two wrinkles. It's important that your mule and donkey picks up the bit and carries it. That's what you want to do. They will show you where the most comfortable place is for, for you to place the bit, but you do not adjust it at that time. You're going to use the Mule Riders Martingale over a six month time frame. You're going to use it in a round pin. You're going to use it on the side of a mountain. You're going to ride this Mule Riders Martingale anywhere you want to ride. But at the end of six months, you no longer will need the Mule Riders Martingale. You will then go to my correctional mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. I've taken and, and uh, Rainsman makes my, makes my bits. They are American made. You notice that? Made in USA, not Pakistan or any place else. So they make my bits. I designed the bit using the correctional mouthpiece, but I changed how the port sets in the mule's mouth. Now remember, your palate of your mule is comes from the donkey. And so we have to have this part of the bit whisking the top. So to answer the question, 
just having the martingale itself on on the average bit is not going to work it'll they'll brace against it they'll gap their mouth and this sort of thing so the buying the whole bridle together it's a full toolbox it does everything you need to do when you start taking it apart and start matching into your stuff it's not going to work as correct i spent a lot of years trying to figure out how to make this thing work yeah. correctly and 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 i'm sure if you want to take it apart you, once you buy it you do what you want to do but you're going to find this bridle is going to work correctly if you use it according to what i do in the video the video says do it like this you'll get results very good matter of fact uh, that that's a good segue i just want to remind folks that right now um if you we are offering it Inside the video, Gaining Trust, Getting Results, uh, there is a demonstration there uh, using the Sir Single and the Mule Riders Martingale. It's a fantastic demonstration. Uh, we go through so many pieces about talking and thinking like a mule and donkey to get results. And just t tell me this, folks. Just tell me this. You go out, you train, and it just feels like they ain't going to listen. They're not going to do what they what you're telling them to do, they're stubborn, they're just digging their heels in, and they're wanting you to leave them alone as much as possible. And the frustration and the feeling that comes with that. Versus what we heard a little bit earlier uh, from one of the viewers saying, I got my come along rope, I'm enjoying riding, I'm enjoying training. That feeling when you go out there, you get them to do something three times on the right side, three times on the left side, and you're done. You feel like, man, we really made some progress today. And then you come out a couple days later, six times on the right side, six times on the left side. Man, how good does that feel? Well, this gaining trust, getting results video, um, it is a clinic from 2019. It's uh, one of Steve's clinics and it is fantastic. Now, some of the videos you can actually find here or there on our YouTube channel. So we didn't feel right putting it up for sale knowing that, you know, hey, you can get some of them on YouTube. But the entire video itself, the only way that you can get it right now, we'd put it into a special and you can get it on the website. Any purchase of $100 or more now through May 31st. So as soon as June 1st hits, uh, it goes away. It, you'll just have to go find them on YouTube and you know put the pieces together. But if you're looking to get a Mule Riders Martingale, if you're looking to get the ground foundation starting kit, that come along rope, rope halter, and problem mule uh, building a new foundation video, now's the time to do it. So I just want to put that out there. Make sure y'all know, go to muleranch.com. We automatically send the video to you. It's digital. You can watch it right away. So I wanted to mention that because I don't want folks coming next week saying, hey, time ran out. Nobody told me about the video. Now you know. No one's half the battle. Uh, let's tack on to a bit question here. Red Eagle says, what bit do you recommend if I'm only going to be packing Abner for my trap line? Um, I will I will walk him, not ride him. He will carry my traps. Or is the rope halter the way to go over a bit for this? Yep. All you need is the rope halter uh, and the come along hitch. Now, you're going to use the rope halter to tie your, your mule up. Now, she traps. She does a lot of trapping, so she's going to be using her mule for that. So uh, you're going to use the come along hitch to lead the mule around. And then when you stop to work on your traps, you're going to take the come along hitch off. You're going to tie the mule with the rope halter and just put the come along hitch to one side. Get your trapping done. Put the come along hitch back on. Oh, excuse me. Oh, pardon me. Put the come along hitch back on and go to your next trap line, you know. But you don't need a bit when you're just leading. That's good to know. Very good to know. Uh, let's see here. Hopping back over on to Facebook. Uh, Lewis is watching. Says, hey, guys. Lewis from East Texas. Love my trail light and cowboy saddle. Just brought, just bought, uh, just bought. Rode four times now. Six to 15 mile trail lights. Awesome saddle. Bug buddy Craig Pitt had to order one after he rode mine. And other buddies looking to order the same. Love seeing that, Lewis. Thank you so much. And Lewis. If any of them have questions and you feel like, well, gosh, I don't know, give them Steve's number, 
have them call Steve. Steve will talk to them and uh, and make sure that they get all the answers they need and they're confident, you're confident, we're all good. Uh, Karen is watching. Karen, good to be here again. Great weather in Central Virginia. Karen, we'll take it. Johnson's Taxidermy. Sherman Johnson, Norman, Oklahoma. I've got a four-year-old that is very shy of the pad and saddle. She has a couple of white spots on her scapulas from the previous owner. How do I get her to take the saddle without being scared to death of it? I have used the come along rope on her and she respects it well, but she's still scared of the saddle. Steve, this is a really good question. What do you say? Yeah. Well, you know, is it really scared of the saddle or does it, is it really worried that the saddle's going to hurt him? Uh, I, I've, I've seen, uh, I've had people tell me about the mule went to move when they went to put the saddle on, or even the mule even kicked the saddle out of their hands, you know. So, uh, you know, let's go back to the basics. Let's get the mechanical out of the way. Go and take your mule to a chiropractor and have them check it out first. Then go and get your dental work done, get your dental and your chiropractor. Now, we start looking at the saddle. Now, if, if there again, if that back cinch isn't tight and the front cinch is loose, you're making your mule, you're making your donkey uncomfortable. Folks, I realize that this is completely different than what, you, what you've learned, especially being in the horse world, because very few people even wear a rear cinch uh, when they're riding. And then they go to ride the mule, and they're doing the same thing, and they're making, they're making the mule uncomfortable. They're making their donkey uncomfortable. So there it comes right down to it, is that most likely, uh, if, if we get the mechanical out of the way, the back and the teeth, then you need to start looking at the problem with being in the, the saddle itself. Very good. Especially how you got it rigged up. Yeah. Send pictures to you Steve. He'll saddle. take a look. Yeah. The simplicity of it, look at it like this. If you see a saddle with billets hanging down and just a leather rear cinch, it's not a mule saddle. Mm. Period. Mm. Uh, let's see. Jack is watching. 80 and humid in Johannesburg today. Internet running slow for me. Jack, hopefully you can hear us even if you can't see our beautiful, wonderful faces. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, Dorsey says, I have your mule riders. Martingale just needs some tips for using. Uh, also, have your saddle and bridge. And Dorsey, uh, did you, have you been able to watch the mule riders Martingale uh, video. Have you been able to see that? And then my other uh, question would be is, um, have you checked out the YouTube ch uh, page? There's a couple things on the YouTube page as well. Steve, are there any quick tips that it's just like, hey, Mule Riders Martingale, here's where people will kind of have some trouble, get hung up, try doing this? Well, it's, you know, there's no short time fix when it comes to any training. Every mule is going to ask questions about these bits different. Uh, Dorsey, the best thing you can do is shoot some pictures, maybe even a short video, and, and let me see what's going on. Or maybe call me and tell me what kind of problems you're really having with the martingale, uh, you know, uh, or with your meal. A lot of times maybe we're making the bit up too high or it's too loose, uh, all those things. Maybe you're stringed down between the legs. Always go back to the video and make sure you dotted every I and crossed every T there because that's very informative. Very good. Uh, let's see here. Moving right along. Got lots of great folks hanging out with us today. Folks, y'all just make us feel tops. Thank you so much for spending time. Uh, Mary says, hello from Arkansas. I just purchased a Molly Mule a few weeks ago and bought the Come Along Hitch and Halter videos. Loving my mule and training. There it is right there. Loving my mule and training. Folks, don't you want to love training, not dread it? Don't you want to love getting out there and working with the animal and that feeling of reward that comes yep. when you learn, you apply, and you train, and you see results? We want that for you. That's why we're here every single week. Uh, great to hear that, Mary. Um, let's see here. Steve, what is the difference between the downhill hip pad and the triple duty pad, and what does each of them do? Okay. So what we're having is uh – we're seeing a lot of horses that are bred with big hips that are bred for being in cattle and working deep. So now we got the hip is higher than the wither. And so you're trying to trail ride. This horse was designed for being in an arena 
and the mule you ended up with has that that hip and bone structure. So what do we do? Well, usually what 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 people have done in the past, and what I've even done, is I just padded up the front so that it would uh, take the pressure off, and now the saddle's level. The problem with that is now when I've done that, instead of having my saddle fit all the way across, now it bridges. I'm tight in where I want it to be, uh, where I, I want to be up, where I want it to be up, right here. But now I'm tight back here in the kidneys, and now I'm destroying the kidneys. So I may be fixing one problem, but I'm correct. I'm making two or three more problems. So what we've done is my bars fit. That's the main thing. No saddle pad is going to make your saddle fit correctly. So what I've done was I took a pad that's narrow at the at the back of the saddle and wide at the front of the saddle and it keeps the same proportion as my bar all the way across. So when the saddle sits on top of that uh, downhill pad, it raises it up in the front enough to be able to take and level out the saddle. Now here's the problem. If I take and make a tree to fit the downhill hip, the front of that tree would have to be uh, two and a half, three inches thick in the front and narrow in the back. Well, not only would be, it be hard to make a saddle, but you've only got a saddle tree now for one mule. And if that one mule passes away, now you've got a saddle tree that sets above the wither because of that two and a half, three inches. So I just take my tree, which I know fits. We made a pad that is kind of, kind of bevel shaped, uh, small in the back, wider in the front, follows the line, stays flush all the way across, and that is the downhill pad, hip pad. Now, if I, on the triple, what we did is we added an extra half an inch to the bar area. And so let's say I've got a mule with an elevated spine. So the spine sticks up above the, the loin. Well, that mule you need to be feeding grain and stuff to and you need to exercise it to bring that top line up and get that top line flush. Now, in the meantime, what's going to help is having that pad on there so that it brings it up off the, off of the uh, uh, mule's back. And also, even with my bars, we have designed it, there's usually about a half an inch anyway, but when you put the weight, your weight on top of it, that gets on top of the spine, you can create a problem. So I created that pad for that problem. Also, I created the triple pad for if I've got a working cowboy who is in the saddle eight, 10 hours a day, he's obviously going to be needing more padding and, and a little bit more consistency of the pad uh, for being out there in the mountains all day long. So, and my, my final thing, if I get folks that are in the 300 pound range, uh, that saddle pad does a great job at triple of being able to give the, the saddle support uh, for that added uh, weight. Yep, everything, all of these different saddle pads, they come as a as a, a result of learning from the mule, learning from the donkey, uh, seeing what it is they need, uh, and then creating based around that, not just coming up with something because you come up with it, uh, but actually learning from them. Man, it is past four o'clock. Let's see if we can uh, get through the rest of these questions here real quick, Steve. Oh, uh, man, 410. Wow. Oh, you've got to go somewhere, don't you? No, I'm okay. I'm all right. Oh, okay, go okay. Yeah. Kathleen says, uh, how about advice for the secondary caregiver? Not the one training and spending the majority of time, but helping with feeding, watering, scratching, so as to not mess up what's been learned. Never had this question before. Steve, Kathleen, so glad you asked it. Steve, what would you say to someone who's concerned about, I don't want to mess up anything. I just want to be here to support. Yeah. Well, if we're talking about a person that is there that is sometimes feeding, uh, sometimes brushing and things like this, uh, there's not a lot of things that, that you can go wrong with that except for this. And this happened one time when I was gone. I was doing a clinic and was gone and I had 
uh, a friend of mine who was staying at the ranch uh, take care of my mules while I was gone. When I come back, all of a sudden, about half of my mules was pawing. And I thought, Polly, what? What are you, all are you doing pawing? Well, what he would do, if one was pawing, he'd hurry up and give him his feed. And so that taught him that if you paw, I get your feed. So uh, if that secondary caregiver wants to do something right, when the mule is pawing, don't feed him. Back away. Maybe feed him a half an hour later when they decide they don't want to have to be so tough on you, you know. But, you know, the brushing, there's not a whole lot you can do wrong. You're, you're doing fine. Very good. Glad to hear that. Uh, let's see. Michael over on YouTube has this question. Oh, Mark Miller's watching. Mark, we're glad you're here today. Hey, Mark. Uh, um, let's see here. Uh, uh, Michael says, my baby girl, Nacho, uh, Nettie, is a two-year-old BLM burrow. She is loving life here in Elmo, Texas. Is she too young to start working about pack training? She will also be used to pull a trail cart. Uh, age? Good. What do you think? Fine. Yeah, no, it's she's not too young. She's actually in the perfect age. You know, we we you know two years old. They're learning. Uh, shoot, I've been putting the packs on saddle on them back when they were year old. But you know, would I would I load much on? No. Would I just put the pack saddle on and let them feel it? Absolutely. So little by little, you know, you can pack up, get that little donkey and get that donkey up to you know 100, 125 pounds. And of course, it depends on how how you prepare the donkey but just like anything else folks yeah if you're going to be using these animals you need to get them physically in shape so that mentally they can handle it and don't just pack them and and, and one day and then go you know you know you want to start strengthening them along as as hours and days go by to give them strength to be able to handle that pack trip very good uh, eileen's watching hi eileen good to have you here Hey everyone, she says, good to see ya. Uh, Lynn is watching, she says, what would be the best feed for a draft mule that I got with ribs and hips showing? So Lynn, we talked about this a little bit earlier today. Uh, you can go back, watch the replay for the entire explanation, but Steve, real quick, you just wanna tell uh, tell Lynn about what you like to see uh, on, your, uh, on your drafts? Well, you know, f first of all, get your teeth floated. Get your worming done and that sort of thing. Uh, if you're using them as a draft animal and pulling a wagon, when they're pulling the wagon, they're gonna be fed a certain way. They're gonna be fed certain feeds, and grains, and this sort of thing. When they're just standing in the corral, they're gonna be fed certain grains and, and, and I'm certain feeds. So let's just say I got me a 1,200 pound uh, draft mule and I feed him 20 pounds in the morning, 20 pounds at night of hay. Well, now I'm getting ready to hook him up to wagon and drive this day. Well, I'll also add about uh, two quarts of rolled oats to give him the energy to pull that wagon. But I do not feed him constantly high carbohydrate feed because they will start getting uh, sugar uh, uh, build up and they start getting their fat pockets in their neck and the top of the ribs and you got a problem. That's the mm. thing with carbohydrate feed, you know, alfalfas and grains and corns. I went ahead and I put a link uh, directly to Lynn for the feed talk video and the Mules Can't Stand Prosperity. Lynn, those are going to be like gold for you. I would definitely recommend checking those out. Um, and then if you have any questions, let us know. It's going to be really good stuff for you. Linda's here. I'm late, but I'm here. Linda, the mule servant, and Theo, the sweet one-eyed mule, and Sunny, finally Sunny, <laughs> rural Ohio. Glad to have you here, Linda. Oh, my. Josh, yeah. uh, Casey's uh, better half, says, so what Casey left out is every time Kevin switches gears, he bucks. Doesn't matter if she's riding him, if he's around in the round pin, or if he's just playing. He bucks every time once he's asked to do more than walk. Any thoughts? Switch gears. Okay, so so what that is then, that's called a kick out. So the mule isn't physically and mentally ready to go into a canter. So what that amounts to, I'm riding my mule and I'm in the saddle and I'm loping along, I mean, I'm walking along and I want to go into a canter to the left. So I have to take my left rein, pick it up, which picks my left leg up and I take my left leg and I put against the ribs, which kicks the hip over. And then that hip, that right hip, drives off of the, the ground 
and then the left leg goes out and we go into the correct lead. Now what happens is the mule isn't bucking because that's when they fold in two. What he's doing is he's you don't have him in the proper lead to go into the lead departure to keep to get, to get his spine correct and his hip in the right place. Happens both in the saddle and on the ground. So a lot of people will say they're they're watching their mule, Dave. Mm -hmm. And the mule you see the, the feet are going along. Boom, boom, boom. So they want to go into a canter. Well, they do it the opposite. The right front foot's out. It's the wrong time to go into a canter. It needs to be the left foot's out and then go into the canter. So people are wanting him to go, but he's got his right foot out rather than his left foot out. So he kicks out because his back is uncomfortable because he uh, he's in the wrong lead. So there you are. Now, it also could be that the breaching is pestering him, and if so, he'll have to get over it. You know, that breaching, when he goes into a canter, maybe you may have it too tight. Uh, maybe uh, maybe it's not adjusted correctly. If you want to send me some pictures, I'll be happy to look at it for you, Casey. And hang Very in good. there, Josh. You'll get it. Very good. Uh, Ross is watching. Uh, Emmett. Uh, Raw, Emmett, Idaho, 80 degrees and sunny. Love hearing that. Uh, let's see here. Neil is watching. Neil and Abby from Peshtigo, Wisconsin. Glad to have you guys here. Hondo's here. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Watching from Eloy, Arizona, where uh, it is the surface of the sun hot today. It's coming for us here in the East Valley, too, and out there in Queen Valley. It's coming for us. Uh, Chaplain Steve, Richard Matthews is watching. There you go. Captain. There's Richard, yeah. That's right. Uh, let's see. Kathleen says, thank you. Uh, Red Eagle's wife and Abner's mom. There we go. All right. Uh, P.S. Great. Captains at the fire department. That Very good. Uh, Kathleen gave me a little shout out. You want to hear what she said? Uh -oh. She goes, great MC work, Dave. How about it? Thank you very hey, much, Hey, I Kathleen. hear that all the time. Matter of fact, when I was talking to Ted Brooks the other day, uh, yeah. one of my friends, a doctor and I've helped him with his mules and stuff yeah and he come out here spent a month with me he says hey that MC you got he's pretty sharp so there you are as two of <laughs> two, two bad boys good for you I appreciate it it's a lot of fun uh all right that's all the it's questions the that we have on here what's that the horns growing out your ears those little oh yeah little it's her it's hereditary all millennials have them <laughs> Um, okay, I got a couple more questions. So that's all the questions we have from YouTube and Facebook. I have just a couple of, that were emailed in that I want to that I want to get to here. Uh, Cheryl emailed in. Uh, she's talking about her saddle pad. She says, "I, I purchased uh, one of your pads last year, and I have questions about cleaning. It's starting to smell a little bit, and I wanted to know if I can get a hose and just hose it off. Maybe use some gentle laundry detergent. Um, I'm not sure. Just leaving window cleaner on is going to help. Please advise, Steve. What do you say?" Yeah, don't leave the window cleaner on. Just spray it and wipe it. Now, can you take the hose and hose it down and put it out in the sun? Yes, but don't open it up because then you can crack it down through the middle. Just take him and hose it off really good and then hang it on the hitching rail and let it hang naturally. I've had some people take and hose it off and then they leave it wide open and they crack it down through the middle. Well don't do that that's too much stress too much moisture on that seam through the middle uh doesn't happen very often but it does happen so if you want to hose it off yes you can you've got to remember though that is that is uh wool felt up inside of that thing so it will take it a little bit to dry uh so yeah if you want to hose it off you can do that otherwise uh if i i usually just leave mine out in the sun and they'll quit smelling but with me i love the smell of mules Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Canyon's watching and get this last week we talked about Kentucky and I mentioned that my family's all from Paducah well Canyon says hello my name is Canyon and I am from Paducah Kentucky so he and I were uh, messaging back and forth on Facebook and uh, I I know some of the places that he knows and he knows some of the places that I know so that was fun Great. he says I've been on horses my whole life and I just purchased my first mule he's two years old and scared to death of a human what is the best and safest way to gain his trust and for him to gain my trust? Well, that's tough. Um, unfortunately, back in that country, Dave, 
they uh, they just turn these animals loose and they stay out in a pasture all their their young life and they should be handled. Uh, there's not an easy way there. Uh, the, the only way you can do is to put them in a small pen. Uh, I suggest 10 by 20. You can go 20 by 20 at the most. Do not feed any carbohydrates to this mule. He's gonna he's going to be uh, bouncing off the the walls as it is. Uh, a type of mule like that. Sometimes they're flat born that way, Dave. To where there's there's no training them. They're just they're afraid of everything, and uh, and it's really tough. And sometimes it takes them clear till after seven years old to get to where, you know, you can get them out. But usually when they're scared like that at two years old, you got a long road ahead of you. Yeah. So start, come along, rope, rope halter, problem oh, absolutely. mule. Absolutely. Groundwork, 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 groundwork. Keep groundwork. them in a small pen. Do not turn them out into a pasture. Do not put them with other animals. Um, but but come along, rope, uh, using ground communication using round pin work that new video series that, that we got coming out mm -hmm. that that people get for a hundred dollars uh buying a hundred dollars worth yeah. of, uh, of of equipment yeah that's a great video for showing how to do a lot of basics that's great uh yeah i mentioned that to him so uh last question i got this one's from erica uh just pretty good story here she says steve i have been drinking the kool-aid and have become a mule nut uh, drink it it goes down real nice and smooth i've got a three-year-old gated mule very nice but pushy he knows pressure but i'm having to start back at square one with him to make a long story short he has great disposition very friendly wants to be in your pocket recently i took him on a camping trip and he turned into the mule from you know where obviously i know i am rushing the riding thing and admitting my mistakes with him i'm gonna revisit ground training to build a better foundation with him before riding again Pressed my luck by riding him when he wasn't ready. Did great play, did great around my place and pasture, but on the camping trip, it got my butt, butt thrown. Now my husband says he will never trust me again, and I want to prove him wrong. I know this mule has what it takes, and I'm ready to work myself. Here are the problems. I need to be more aggressive. I have been afraid to hit him. We all know the story that they will live 30 years just to get revenge. I've watched some free videos. I did the whole kicking him in the shins thing. I actually seen him think about pawing after I tried on that. I seen him think, oh, that's not a good idea. Idea, and he set one foot back down without pawing. Also, I feel like I've taught him to back up a little too well. He retreats from everything when he doesn't understand what I'm asking. When he isn't comfortable, I believe I taught him to do this. This is what got me thrown. He almost backed into a bicycle and it scared him. He also reared up before bucking me off. My goodness. I really just want to know if you think I've ruined him or if starting over will produce a handy, safe, mule I'm wanting to create. After coming home, I'm concerned on Astel demand and having more positive results such as more concise front end to the right. Um, I've been trying lateral flexions to soften him but decided to no longer try flexions after reading your Good. articles and watching your videos. I've been using the rope halter, added reins to the side, and seems to be doing better in a mechanical hack and more. I've purchased mule bridle with a nose, brand sta nose band standing martingale attachment. He's planning on using it as a side pull. He gets more accustomed to a bit. I bought the come along rope, planning to purchase the problem mule video, and after the wreck, my husband says he'll never he will never trust him and I've tried to explain it's my fault and not the mules. Um, just goes on to uh, yielding hindquarters, trust. Can I gain trust? Um, once they learn to buck, it'll happen again. Um, appreciate no. your thoughts. What do you what do you say here? What do you say here to Erica? Well, basically they all buck. They all buck. You're gonna hear me say that in that video time and time again. Okay, so Let's go back. You know, yes, you got into several things that were a wreck. On your car, you got a bumper on the front. But when you make a mistake and a bumper on the back, when somebody else makes a mistake, so mistakes are going to be there. Uh, can you trust the animal? Yes. Go back and build a foundation. No problem. You know, I have helped a lot of mules and a lot of mule people. Uh, but just take your time and enjoy the ride. You know, enjoy the run. Um, do you come along work? Do your ground work? Uh, get, get them to where they start learning to trust you and you'll be just fine. Uh, is it going to take a while? Yes. You know, here's the downside folks. I've had people take and get themselves a mule and then have a problem, get rid of that mule. 
Then they get another mule. Well, now they have another problem. Well, they get rid of that mule. Then they have another problem. Folks, sooner or later, you're going to have to just say, all right, here's the problem me. And she said, yes, I'm the problem. All right. Then let's go back. Let's get our timing in. Let's do our groundwork and this sort of thing uh, and go from there. You know, mules aren't going to buck uh, unless they've been hurt. So we have to consider that. Get your teeth done, do the chiropractic work, and then enjoy the enjoy the, the, the training. Very good. Steve, we got through everything today. Folks, if there was a question that you asked and I didn't see it, I worked real hard to see it, uh, but if for some reason I missed it, please send me a message, support at muleranch.com. We'll get it taken care of. Thank you to everybody who joined us today. I just put a link in the comment section uh, for uh, where you can learn about the details for this video that we're giving away. It's a fantastic video. There are 11 parts, soon to be 13 parts uh, to this video, graining trust, getting results, and it's an entire day a clinic uh, from 2019 with Steve and a group of about uh, eight or nine different students uh, from green all the way to experienced. Uh, fantastic video work, if I do say so myself. And uh, y'all can get that, and uh, it, it will go a long way for helping you with a lot of the basics, both for tuning up and also establishing that first ground foundation. Um, ground foundation. There you go. Steve, anything you want to say before we're all done today? No, by God, you all get in there and keep enjoying these meals. Dave, I get uh, I get phone calls and emails and texts all yeah. the time of saying, people saying, I really enjoy uh, you and Dave, you know, sharing and helping out. And that's yeah. that's what we're here for, to help, you know. Uh, and speaking of helping folks, you know, you hear a lot about first responders uh, and this sort of thing. I, I'm here to tell you, uh, I, I'm, uh, you know, proud to say that I'm part of this fire department over here. And seeing these guys put forth the effort, and mm -hmm. these gals put forth the effort to help people. Yeah, I mean, literally putting their lives on the line. Um, it, when you when you've been on auto accidents that I've been on, and seeing these first responders get in there and go to the problem rather than run away from the problem, Dave, that is awe inspiring. You know, uh, especially these guys out here on volunteers. You take guys like. Uh, Richard, Captain Richard, that uh, said, hey, Steve, hey, chaplain. Uh, yeah, man, guys like him, for 15 years, he has put his life on the line. And, uh, and it, it's important, folks, that we pray for these men and women that are out there. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm leaving here, and just as soon as I finish with this broadcast, I'm going to go yeah. down to the fire department and prepare some things. I've been asked to, I'm a chaplain for the fire department, but I've been asked now uh, to... Uh, to do some very special work in helping people uh, uh, be what's that yeah uh, in in the in the rehabbing uh, so I get to be the rehabbing specialist which is awesome so I'm going to prepare some things and we got some fires coming up they say that June is going to be tough here in Arizona yeah. we got a lot of firefighting to, to do a lot of and fighting a fire out here in this brush and this sort of thing is uh, mm, let me tell you, Dave. It makes you. It makes makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. We we fought one here uh, about three days ago, and it was tough. You know, it really was on sides of mountains and this sort of thing. And our guys got right in there and was hand and foot putting forth the effort. And so, uh, folks, uh, you know, pray for your first responders, your firefighters, and this sort of thing, your police officers, and especially those nurses that are in there and doctors that are putting forth the effort, you know, um, uh, just like the Bible says, and, and this we will get through, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Folks, thank you so much for spending some of your day, your time with us, allowing us to just kind of share what it is we've been learning, what it is we've been um, you know, trying out here for the last 40 years or so. Uh, if there's anything else we can do to help, be sure, let us know. Call Steve, go to muleranch.com, and I put a yes. link in the comment section. When we're done here, you can go check out if you want to know more details about the promotion that runs uh, less than five days now. So May 31st at 11.59 p.m., uh, that, that video goes away, and we'll, we'll bring it out sometime again next year maybe. Uh, but uh, go ahead, go get it now uh, if, if that's something that interests you there. Thank you, everyone. Yep. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Blessings to you. Bye-bye.